This is the main character of the film, a military psychologist named Jane Lee, who is serving on a US base in Afghanistan. Jane is currently in video communication with his wife and daughter. She announces to them the good news that she is flying home for the holidays for two whole weeks. The family is looking forward to seeing her because they are quite rare. And then Jane notices that she is already late for her flight. On her way out, she is intercepted by a woman who poses as an NSA employee named Whitney Smith. Jane replies that she is very late for her flight, but Whitney politely offers to give her a ride. In the car, Jane reveals that she is finally flying home for Christmas. Out of courtesy, she also inquires about Whitney's holiday plans, but she replies that her main plan for the holidays is Captain Jane Lee. Jane angrily explains that she hasn't seen her family for a year and a half and nothing will stop her on her way home. In the next scene, Jane is already flying in the cargo hold of the plane with a bag over her head. After that, the car brings them to the secret base of the NSA. There they are met by a confident lady who introduces herself as Principal Stevens. The director gives her a short tour of analytical management and talks about problems with information processing. After all, all emails and all correspondence go through them. Stevens said their lead analyst has been experiencing some problems lately, putting the security of all of America at risk. She leads Jane through a huge server room, at the end of which, behind a screen, is their top employee named Bob. Bob is a computer in the form of a huge human brain, in the middle of which there is a monitor with an artificial eye. Just at that moment, an agent named Chris is mopping him up. Bob immediately gives away everything he knows about Janum and he knows a lot. At the sight of this mountain of biomass, shocked Jane throws up on the floor, which adds a little work for Chris. Despite this, the psychologist is quickly taken into circulation and brought up to date. Bob's problem is that he can't track down a single hacker and terrorist named Lucas T. Waite. They are sure that this criminal is planning a terrorist attack for Christmas, but they do not know exactly where and when. Before that, Bob coped with all the tasks, but Lucas managed to miss. Physically, Bob is fine, so they brought in a psychologist. According to them, Jane is very responsible and simply cannot leave a soldier in trouble. And Bob is a very important soldier, because he is on duty around the clock. And now he is sick. In her room, Jane contacts the family again and tries to explain that she has a very important task, so she still won't come home. Hearing these words, her daughter begins to cry and the wife is offended and cuts off the connection. Instead, Bob suddenly appears on the screen and tries to apologize for the bad acquaintance. Jane accepts the apology and hangs up, but Bob suddenly appears on the TV screen. He tries to ask her about the upcoming psychotherapy, but Jane asks not to invade her privacy and give her a break. She turns off the TV, but a drone suddenly appears outside the window and continues the conversation in Bob's voice. When Jane refuses to speak again, Bob turns on the fire extinguisher in her room and locks the front door. She tries to get out, but looks like she'll have to shower all night. The next morning, a wet Jane is late, causing her superiors to reprimand her. The woman justifies herself that she just wanted to smoke in the room and accidentally turned on the fire detectors. Jane is left alone with Bob and he apologizes again. After that, he notes that he knows everything in the world and it is unlikely that she will be able to help him. Jane asks for two hours, but Bob only gives her an hour and ten minutes because she was fifty minutes late. Jane asks Bob to describe his problem on his own. Bob explains to the woman that his vision works on the principle of echolocation. Like bats, but many times cooler. Thanks to the internet and other technologies, he can keep track of all people at the same time and knows almost everything about them. Where they are, what they do, who they correspond with what they talk about. A puzzled Jane runs Bob through a few simple tests, gradually moving on to the main problem, Lucas T. Waite. According to Bob, somehow this Lucas always eluded him. A few months ago, he got off the subway car and since then Bob has not been able to figure him out. Because of this, he feels real anger or, rather, sadness. Jane asks Bob about his only wish in case of a possible meeting with the magic genie. After some thought, Bob remembers one person he likes to watch. The man's wife wants an iPad for Christmas, but instead he builds her some strange wooden contraption with his own hands, either a feeder, or a shelf for shoes. According to Bob, he even knows what the president will have for lunch next Thursday, but this thing really confused him. If he had one desire, he would like to know what it is. Suddenly, Bob interrupts a nice conversation and reports the location of a certain person, who is immediately destroyed by a drone. For this, Bob apologizes again and invites her to continue. But after such a sight, Jane is clearly not in the mood. She asks Bob if it's easy for him to kill a man. He replies that he does not kill them, but only finds them. Moreover, they are bad people. Many people die every day, including good ones. But Jane still thinks Bob is guilty and makes him very angry. In order to get revenge, Bob also tries to get into Jane's soul and plays her a live broadcast of her wife and daughter decorating the Christmas tree cutely. According to him, apparently they are quite happy without it. Jane asks Bob not to overstep personal boundaries, but he does not stop and brings her to tears. Satisfied, Bob asks Jane to leave, 
as their time is up. But the girl persuades him to stop playing the villain, because she is confident in his kindness and empathy. Bob is a little embarrassed and Jane asks him to talk about his feelings. Instead, he demonstrates to her some of the principles of his work. For example, when he was watching Lucas in the subway, then next to him was a certain Eddie Wilson, who spent his first Christmas without his beloved wife and children. Also nearby is George Preston, drinking beer after nine years of sobriety. And a little further on sits a woman with children's clothes. This is Sally Benson and she's barren. Then little Amanda Jackson asks her older sister to take a picture of her with Santa sleeping in the car. But she rudely answers her that Santa does not exist. Thus, revealing to her the most terrible secret of the world. And these are just a few people in one subway car in one city. And how much grief every second exists all over the world. Bob sees it all and has been crying since the moment he turned it on. After speaking out, Bob suddenly notices Lucas' location again. The criminal leaves the subway, buys something in the store and, disappears again. The boss runs into the room and orders Bob to quickly find the terrorist, but a depressed Bob says that they are too late. Meanwhile, Lucas T. Waite, leaves a wrapped Christmas present in the middle of a subway car and leaves. Someone is trying to find out whose box it is, but then a powerful explosion is heard. Bob is distracted by the suffering of each victim of the terrorist attack and again misses the perpetrator. Principal Stevens retires in anger and informs Jane that she is free. The girl reports that Bob has made serious progress in his condition. But the director replies that the operation failed and now it's none of her business. Bob failed and received an order to deactivate it. Jane emphasizes that this is a murder, but the director explains that they just turn off the computer, instead of which there will be a new one, and then a second, and a third, and as needed. Jane asks for some more help for Bob, but Stevens reminds her of Christmas Eve and that she is expected at home. At this point, Bob is disconnected, and shattered Jane packs her things. Suddenly, Chris comes to her and says that Bob is already offline, but wants to talk to her and say goodbye. The girl goes to Bob and he tells how strange it is not to hear or see anyone but her. It seems to be the way ordinary people communicate. Bob adds that he is slowly dying and doesn't want to be left alone. A touched Jane starts to cry and tells Bob about her main problem. She always wants to feel needed, but since Bob is dying, she feels useless. Bob tries to calm Jane by explaining that you can't help everyone. But that doesn't mean she's useless, it means she's only human. Jane calms down and asks Bob again about his one wish. Bob wishes that Santa Claus still existed. The NSA is also celebrating New Year's corporate parties and Chris is already drinking. Suddenly, Jane runs up to him and drags him back to turn on Bob. A dumbfounded Chris tries to explain to Jane that they will go to jail for this. But the girl declares that she wants to be Santa for a little while for Bob. Having learned about their intentions, Bob personally asks not to do this, because they will be imprisoned for treason but he will be turned off anyway. But Jane and Chris still turn on Bob, and he can see that his main mystery is not a feeder or shoe rack, but a symbol of life support, which is the wife for that man. His wife is overjoyed, but a happy Bob admits he never would have guessed. Bob is very grateful to his friends for the gift, but he is forced to state the fact that they will be imprisoned anyway, and he will be turned off. But since he is no longer an employee of the NSA and his hands are untied, then in the end he is going to do something. At this moment, information about almost half a million new orders is received on the tablet of an employee of the serving warehouse, and thousands of drones from an unknown Santa immediately begin to deliver them to the addresses of those in need. Someone gets a notification about the full repayment of the mortgage, someone gets new sneakers, someone gets a small puppy. Even Lucas T. Waite gets his ember because he was a very bad boy. Just then director Stevens bursts into the room with security and orders Jane and Chris to be arrested. But they do not advise doing this, since Bob has seized control of the entire system and must complete one important mission. Bob informs the director that there is a present for her, too, because a minute ago the FBI took Lucas T. Waite, and he also asks not to punish Chris and Jane, at least because now he has the entire US nuclear potential under control. Principal Stevens gives an and, after talking to the president, reveals that they have been pardoned. In return, Bob politely returns control of the nuclear arsenal to him. The principal warns that the president will not forgive them for this and she hopes it was worth it. Bob explains what it cost, because Santa really showed up for one night. After that, the corporate party is smoothly transferred to Bob's room and the employees continue to celebrate. With a bag on her head, Jane is being taken somewhere again. The employee hands her the phone, on the wire of which Bob's voice is heard again. Jane apologizes for not saying goodbye, but Bob says that he himself ordered her to be urgently taken away so that she would not be late. Jane asks where else she might be late. Suddenly, the bag is removed from her and the girl realizes that she is at her house. She and Bob say goodbye, and Jane goes home, where she is greeted by a happy family. 